Welcome to the Porch Roof Classic, a retro baseball podcast novel in 15 or so episodes by Jeff Pullman. Episode 10. Two nights later, my dad took me to see the Woodstock concert movie on Discount Monday at the Bijou Majestic in West Springfield, and it was his idea. I'm guessing one of his coat-selling cohorts had a teenage kid who'd already seen the film, and Phil was curious about its cool new music, being a fan of Ray Charles and Ramsey Lewis in his time. He also probably wanted to see hippies in action so he could tell me what not to do with my life. Izzy's dad had actually marched into Izzy's room recently to confiscate his incense sticks, a move I could definitely see old Phil attempting. For someone who mostly listened to AM pop stuff, Woodstock was like getting a dump truck of culture unloaded on my head. I dug the powerful Who, folksy Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and funky Sly Stone. Both of us were euphoric for Santana. About five minutes into Soul Sacrifice, Phil Tosh came as close to getting up and dancing in an aisle as he ever would in his life. He resorted to bouncing his right leg inside his checked slacks and lightly wiggling his behind on the seat like a washing machine on spin. The scenes of drugs and hippies and hippie drugs were a different story, though. Many times I heard him sigh or saw him lightly shake his head, and the moment we were back on the sidewalk, he was back in Phil knows best mode. You don't do any of that stuff, right? Dad, I'm 14. I know. Just let it be a warning. Your buddies, the Beatles, started experimenting with illegal mind drugs, and look what it did to them. I did, and helped them create the Sgt. Pepper album. He rolled his eyes and directed me to the Catalina in the parking lot. Drugs make you rebel against everything and everyone. I'm just saying you need to be careful when you get older and go to college. I'm just entering high school, Dad. You're always rushing me. It's good advice you can use later. Never too early for that. Well, it sure seemed like you liked that druggy music just as much as I did. He badly hid a smile as he unlocked the driver door. Most of it, yeah but not the crazy hard rock. Tuesday's rain began to spit out of dark gray clouds around noon, a half hour before practice start time. Danny was right to question one thing. We never had practices, but with his presence, a possible problem, I wanted to play it safe with a big experiment. Mom would be out getting her hair done, but she'd made us a plate of chicken salad sandwiches we had to keep covered on the porch so the flies wouldn't get to them. Izzy and Jean showed up at 12.15, grumbled about the weather already and wanted to reschedule. Ten bucks says Danny ass ditches, said Izzy. Bullies and cowards tend to do that. He said he'd be here, he even said he was excited. I'll be more excited if I don't have to look at his stupid one-handed swing, said Jean. What's he trying to prove? That his arms are bigger than ours, said Izzy, along with something else. Scotty arrived a few minutes later in a blinding grape-colored rain poncho we gave him crap about immediately. It's my sister's, so zip it. It has a zipper, too? So snap it. The light drizzle led up by 12.45, and sun threatened to poke out. Danny still wasn't there, and we were this close to a cancellation when we heard a car rumble up to the house, announce its muscular engine. Four doors opened and closed. We looked at each other. Robbie suddenly appeared on the back porch, little baseball glove under his armpit, and munching a Pop-Tart. Danny's here, and his friends. We shared wary glances. I started around to the front yard, but Danny and his entourage met me halfway. Danny wore cut-off shorts and his repulsive star-splattered polo shirt again. He'd applied a dark substance under his eyes that was meant to be either war paint or something to combat the glare that didn't exist. He wore a batting glove on one hand and a spanking new fielding glove on the other that looked to be fresh out of its box. Behind him strolled Mick Shaw, elfin and annoying, in sweatpants and a sleeveless t-shirt that showed off his scrawny, chalky arms. Mick's stocky brother was with them, jingling his car keys, and a pair of homely, identical twin high schoolers brought up the rear. "'Who's this?' I asked, motioning to the twins. "'Cousins from Chicopee,' barked Mick. Stan and Dan, said Danny. Huge baseball nuts. Got a problem with it? asked Mick's brother. Well, no, except you didn't say you were bringing friends, and they're a lot older than us. Hey, we don't have to do this, said Mick. We could just go over to Funland today and meet chicks. 
My brother drives, you know. Yeah, we know he drives. I just want to make sure everything stays fair. Didn't you say it was a practice, Joey? asked Danny. Why are you worried about fair? Never mind. Let's just practice something. Home runs, yelled Izzy. No, I said, let's do that thing where everyone gets a chance to bat for two outs. That sounds kind of faggy, said Mick. I vote for a home run derby. For cash, added his brother. Count me out then, said Izzy. What? You just said you liked homers. Yeah, but not ones that cost. I don't have a dime in my wallet. That's okay. You can owe me, said Danny, after I win. Yeah, right, said Gene. In exchange for the Sox tickets you said you'd get us? Hey, those were for Joey, not you. And I never told him it was a sure thing, reamed. It was through a friend of my dad's. What'd you just call me? Reamed. Actually, I think it was Reem Creamed, said Mick. Gene's face erupted and he took a menacing step toward him. I'll wrap you around a tree so squirrels can eat your eyeballs out, you little twerp. Try it, said Mick's brother. Okay, okay, I yelled, step between them. Can we just play this two-out thing and see how it goes? Fine, said Gene, and I'm up first. He snatched Black Bonzo from Izzy and marched off to home plate. Danny shook his head with a smirk. And next batter up pitches, announced Izzy, armed himself with a half dozen wiffle balls. BFD, mumbled Mick and found a spot in the outfield. His brother grumpily followed, parked himself a few feet behind Mick and stuck his gloveless hands in his pockets. I opted for a quasi shortstop location and the Chicopee twins spread out and backed up to the garage wall as far as they could. Throw to the pitcher before the runner reaches first and it's an out. Like we didn't know that, said Mick. Izzy tossed a couple of pitches in, and Gene swung so hard he practically broke his collarbone. Robbie looked on from the porch with his second Pop-Tart, no doubt impressed. Relax, man, Izzy said, and floated in another pitch that could have stopped for a pitcher of beer on its way to home plate. Gene timed it well and blistered it out to left, where Mick's brother removed one of his bare hands from its pocket and calmly snatched it out of the air. Nice try, he said. All-star, shouted Mick. Eat me, said Gene, and dug in again. He fouled off the next two offerings, then dribbled the grounder right to Izzy and trudged to the outfield with his glove. The sticky drizzle picked up during the two-out game, then lessened, then repeated, and everyone got the hit with Danny asking to go last, after lunch, that is. We bunched around the glass porch table, dined on mom's sandwiches and two bowls of state-line chips. As expected, me, Izzy, and Gene took one end of the table and Danny's gang the other, with Scotty right between. There were two camps of hushed joking going on, without any fusion. Then Danny rapped his knuckles on the table. Who thinks I can hit ten straight homers? Get bent, said Gene. Okay, not you. Who does? Mick raised his puny hand. All right, a believer. How about you, Tosh? I suppose it's possible. No freaking way, continued Gene, especially with your dumb one-handed swing in the rain. Danny was waiting for that response and leaned in. Five bucks says I can. He reached in his back pocket, took out a green plaid wallet, and extracted a five-dollar bill. You on, Remar? Damn right I am. So where's your cash? At home in one of my socks. Don't worry, Blight. I won't have to get it anyway. All Danny did was smile and pocket the five. Lunch was officially over. There was a break in the drizzle. Danny strode to home plate with her skinny yellow bat. Izzy scooped up some balls, already planning the pitches in his mind. But Mick's ape-like brother stepped in his way five feet from the mound. Where are you going? To pitch. What do you think? Nope, said Mix, and wedged his way between them, toting the rest of the balls. Already called dibs on this. Says who? Says me, shouted Danny from home plate. It's my idea, so I get to pick the pitcher. But that's not the way we've been doing it, I said. Tough, said Mick. Different game now. Actually, it's not even a game, said Danny. It's more like an exhibition, a performance. So, my rules. Izzy stood there a long, exasperated second, then just dropped the balls at Mick's feet and walked away. Fine, he muttered. Be a Nazi. What'd you call him? sputtered Mick's brother. He was looking for a fight any way possible. A Nazi pig and a cheater, yelled Gene from the outfield. What's the matter? You're deaf, too? Can we just get this over with, I asked. Danny gave me a two-finger victory salute and outlined a personal batting box into the ground with his sneaker. The yellow bat dangled at waist level in his right hand. 
Mick waited until his friend was set, then tossed in a ridiculously slow balloon of a pitch. Before me or Jean had a chance to protest, Danny swung and lined the thing halfway up the porch roof. That's one, Danny cried. That's bullcrap, yelled Jean. My grandma could hit that pitch over the house with her cane. Really, I added, put a little speed on the dumb ball, okay? Mick waved me off, put less of an arc on the next pitch, but it was just as slow. Danny took a bigger swing and rifled the ball over the high garage wall and left. Two! You might as well hit him out of your hands, said Izzy. This is a joke. This time, Mick took a few steps back, made us think a faster pitch was coming, then tossed in the same ham sandwich he did the first time. You bast too late. The ball was over our heads, over the porch, skipping off the top of our chimney en route to Squaw Farm Road and grassy parts. I'll get it, chirped Robbie and scampered around the side of the house. I'm not paying you five cents, Blight, said Jean. No need to yet, said Danny, dug back in, clearly enjoying himself. Seven more dingers to go. And I'm pitching the last five, cried Mick. The hell you are. Whack! This one was lined so low and so hard it was dancing up the slope of the porch roof before we could even raise our gloves. You should have seen where it landed, squeaked Romney, coming back around the side of the house, next to the mailbox. Okay, screw this, announced Jean. He dropped his glove and marched to the mound. He looted a clumsy lunge from Mick's brother and snatched up a few wiffle balls. Get the hell out of here, shouted Mick. No, you! He pushed Mick to the ground with one hand. Mick bounced back up and went at Jean with his puny fists. Enough! yelled Janny. It's Reamhead's money, so let him pitch and try to protect it, which he won't. He waggled the bat menacingly at Jean. Mick huffed but stepped aside. Jean set himself, then went into a wind-up in Juan Marichal leg kick delivery I'd never seen before, and fired his first pitch straight at Danny's head. He ducked. The ball grazed the top of his red hair and got impaled on a bush branch behind him. He looked stunned for a moment, more by the idea of anyone daring to attack him than the actual danger of the pitch. I flashed on my Sloppy Joe's incident in the junior high cafeteria. This was going to be worse. Danny stared at the ground and gathered his thoughts a second, then whipped the bat at Jean like a helicopter blade. Jean leaped to dodge the projectile, landed on his butt, and when he looked up again, Danny was on top of him. Scotty and Izzy and Mick Brother and the Chicopee twins and me frantically tried to pry them apart, but it was like unlocking mating crabs. Jean's lip bled and everyone was yelling, and I could hear Robbie screaming and crying and that had even started to rain again. Get off me, ass face, cried Jean. Not until you apologize. I don't apologize to scumbag cheaters. And they went at it again. Gene managed to roll him over and tried to scratch his face. I got my friend in a bear hug from behind and hoisted him up, Scotty doing the same to me. Happy now, I said, and ran over to embrace a whimpering Robbie. I'll be happy when this piece of crap is out of my life, yelled Gene. Mick and his brother helped Danny to his feet, Danny breathing hard, knocked dust and grass out of his hair, his scheming mind doing cartwheels. So, is practice over? asked one of the dim-witted chickapeers. Oh, you bet it is, said Danny, but this isn't. By a long shot. He stepped over to me, his face beat red and his hands clamped on his hips. One game here to settle everything, before high school starts. Meaning like in two weeks. Nine innings of duel to the death wiffle ball. North Marsh versus South Marsh. Winners get bragging rights from September to June. He stuck his hand out. Deal? The idea was terrifying. It also had a worthy purpose and was an event we could at least prepare for. I looked around at Izzy, who was helping wipe the blood off Jean's mouth with the bottom of his t-shirt. Izzy was already shrug-nodding. Okay, then, I said, exhaled loudly and shook his hand. You're on. Danny's smirk returned, and he motioned for his slimy entourage to march back around that side of the house with him. Well, kick their damn asses, said Izzy the second they were gone, right? None of us answered him. I would wait to announce the so-dubbed Porch Roof Classic to my parents. We hadn't even settled on a date for the game yet, and I knew Dad still had a possible vacation weekend in Rhode Island on his mind. It was tough enough just trying to calm down Robbie. Later that night, the subject of our usual pre-sleep whispered conversation took on a more profound tone. So what does it mean if we lose? You can't think that way, Robbie. Yeah, but what if it happens? Will you still be able to go to high school? Of course. 
It just means other kids will know and some might rank me out for a while. There was a long pause in the dark. I don't ever want to be ranked out. Yeah, it sucks, but it never lasts. Especially if you act like it doesn't bother you, even though it does. Danny doesn't bother you? No, 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 of course he does. But if I can act like he doesn't, he'll lay off after a while. How do you know he will? He's a jerk face. There's jerk faces everywhere, Robbie. I'm sure you've had some in sixth grade. Oh, yeah. Billy Kipple left his poops in the boys' room toilet. Gross. Anyway, all I'm saying is that the better you think about yourself, the better you'll be able to handle them. The jerk faces, I mean, not the poops. The giggles fell out of Bobby's mouth like pebbles into a gutter. I cringed, and right on cue, Dad pounded on the other side of our wall. After a night of freaky dreams, including one with Danny Blight driving a motorcycle into our house and chasing me down the hall, I reported to Irv's Deli the next morning in a state of paranoid fatigue. Ever had coffee, buddy? asked Irv, who seemed to have it in his veins at all times. Not really. My dad drinks Sanka, though. Oh, please. He grabbed the clean cup from under the counter and filled it with whatever was in a metal pot on a nearby burner. Maxwell House is the real thing, and don't let your dad or anyone tell you different. I gave it a sip and grimaced. It tasted like hot Drano. Better with cream and sugar, trust me. He added ample amounts of both, and I gave the stuff another try. It was a fraction less disgusting. Am I right or am I correct? Finish that off and you'll be ready to tackle a day. I finished just two more sips and set the cup aside. The only thing I really needed was to tackle my nerves, and judging from the jumpy way my dad left the house every weekday, coffee didn't seem like the best remedy. I helped Irv out by toasting a half dozen bagels, then went in the back room in search of more cream cheese. Tomas and Jesus were unloading the dishwasher and sharing a cigarette, and as I waved hello and they nodded back, an idea sparked in my brain. I found a new tub of cream cheese in the big fridge, then swung by the dishwasher. Hey, either of you guys ever play? Uh, baseball, I mean? Little bit, said Jesus with a shrug. Tomas smacked his arm. What you mean, little, hermano? We play in the street all day when we were kids, with marbles and a boat paddle. Whoa, you used a marble for a ball? See, si, it was okay. The marble was white. Had to stop because we broke too many windows, added Jesus. Wicked. I was wondering if you want to play for us in a wiffle ball game. What's a whittle ball? asked Tomas. And who's us? asked Jesus. Just me and a bunch of my friends. And wiffle was a plastic ball with holes in it. Easier than hitting a marble. I don't know, man, said Tomas, grinding out their cigarette on the aluminum countertop. Sounds a little like cosas de baby. What's that mean? Baby stuff. Oh, well, it's not exactly hardball or marbles and boat paddles, but it can be fun and tricky, too, like studying the wind before you pitch and all that. The brothers stared at each other. You play for dinero? asked Tomas. Huh? He rubbed his thumb and finger together in the air, the universal cash symbol. Um, uh-uh, not for money. But it's going to be a big game, and the guy running the other team is a jerk face. I mean, a bad hombre, and he only roots for the Mets. That seemed to snap something in their brains. Jesus took out a fresh cigarette, lit it up, and passed it to his brother. Tell us when, and then you tell us where. Fittingly, NBC's Game of the Week was the Mets versus Pirates, and I had Saturday off, perfect for the strategy research session with Izzy and Jean in our basement. Mom had pizza delivered, and there was even enough for Robbie to scavenge a slice or two. Neither of these guys are going to last, announced Izzy, referring to lefties Jerry Kuzman and Bob Veal with the score of 5-2 to two Mets already in the second. Veal should have been body-checked by now, said Gene. He soon was. The Mets were only three and a half games behind Pittsburgh at the start of the day and didn't let Veal finish the inning. We got to manage our bullpen the same way Murtaugh does, I said. We don't have bullpens, said Izzy. You know what I mean. Rotate the pitcher whenever they get a few runs in an inning. It might throw their timing off. Clemente, Bob Robertson, and Al Oliver all collected hits off coups in the first, but Jerry settled in for a while after that, and we could focus more on the Porch Roof Classic. Think Blight's going to use his illegal one-handed swing again? asked Izzy. Why wouldn't he, said Gene. It's his douchebag trademark. Well, if it's raining again, the bat might slip out of his hand, I said. Yeah, wicked. So maybe we need a rain dance more than strategy. 
Can't believe they're not showing the Red Sox, screeched Robbie all of a sudden, his little transistor radio earpiece stuck in his ear. Uh, probably because they're sort of out of the race, offered Izzy. So what? Who wants to see these dummies? Get lost, Robbie, said Jean. Hey, I blurted, ever protective of my brother, despite Jean being correct. Crap, yelled Izzy as Jerry Grody plowed into little Fred Patek and upended him at second base on a force play. That was radical. I'm doing the same thing to Mick, first chance I get. That's assuming Mick is playing infield and you can get on base. Hardy hard times two. Crap, yelled Robbie. Yeah, it's just hit number 30 to give us the lead, and I can't believe it isn't on. Shit. He flung his half-eaten slice of pepperoni on the basement floor. I said nothing, just grabbed him by the shirt and hauled him up the stairs, tossed him into the kitchen where Mom was starting dinner. He got pizza on the floor, Ma. Can you deal with him? I tore off a few paper towels and ducked back down the steps. Robbie's wails echoed in my ears. How's he been doing? asked Izzy as I came back down. Just great, can't you tell? I picked up the ruined pizza slice, kneeled, and began to wipe up the tomato sauce and grease puddle. Jean stared at me. So when you going to tell us about our ringers? Our what? Izzy says you found a couple secret studs for our team. I paused the wiping for a second. As soon as I know for sure they're playing, I'll fill you in. Good, because you know Danny's bringing those twin chickpea hoods along. Well, we got home run Scotty, don't forget. We'll need a lot more than him, added Izzy. Show your brother how to start the coals, said Dad, minutes after getting home and being briefed on our spat by Mom. Robbie enjoyed crumpling newspaper into balls with me, but he wouldn't touch the sooty and smelly Kingsford briquettes. The whole secret is making sure the vents underneath are open so the fire can breathe, I said. When's that girl you know coming back? Oh, you mean Helen? I don't know. I like her. She's funny. I grabbed the can of lighter fluid and doused the coals with it. Ooh, can I blow them up? You light them, Robbie. You don't blow them up. Can I light them then? Uh, better let me this time. Stand back. He didn't move right away, so I gently nudged him a little, dropped the lit match on the barbecue, and the flames whooped to life. Yikes! He jumped back, wrapped my arm for protection. I warn you. Hey, I didn't mean to be so rough with you before. I was just mad because you dropped the pizza on the floor. Oh, I know. You know that I really care about you, right? Oh, I know. Bertie was our secret weapon who wasn't really a secret, but we hadn't fully utilized him yet. That changed the next day. Gene's guerrilla instincts drew me, Izzy, and Bertie to a storm drain outside the high fence of Marshmallow High School. We ducked through a stinky concrete pipe one at a time and emerged behind the backstop of the school's baseball field. The diamond's grass was unmowed and scorched by the sun, but it had adult-sized base paths with smudges of chalk still on them. Okay, Bertie, I said, time for our lesson. Bertie just stood there with a screwy face. Come on, we talked about this. Show us your secrets. Already told you. Gotta best them to best them. I know, but who's your favorite player ever, Lou Brock? He gave me a blank stare. Jackie Robinson? He shook his head. He was before me. Okay, man, said Jean, a bit irked. Just show us your natural talent then. Come on. I blew off a possible job interview at Dairy Queen for this. Bertie didn't move. Okay, let's play a little pickle, I said. Flip the wiffle ball into Jean's glove and hustled down to the bagless third base spot. Jean rolled his eyes and made himself catch her. What the hell do I do, asked Izzy. Back me up in case a throw goes over my head. Or pretend you're the pitcher. All right, pitcher. He picked his way through the tall grass to the rubber mound, which seemed to be half a football field away. Gene, throw Izzy the ball. Bertie, start with me at third. We set up the play. Bertie scampered up the baseline to where we imagined the third base bag would be. Okay, Iz, pretend you got a wicked comebacker and Bertie takes off for home. Doesn't someone hit the ball to me first? You already have it. Pretending, remember? Oh, right. Go, Bertie! He took off for home plate, kicking up chalky dust. Izzy panicked for a second and threw the ball to Gene. Bertie skidded to a stop, spun, and shot back toward third. Gene whipped the ball to me. Bertie braked again, but this time faked his run to the plate and froze in the path, begging me to move toward him. Izzy, get behind me. What? Why? Just do it. He started for third, but stumbled in the high grass and fell on his face. Shit! I inched down the line toward Bertie. He wiggled, danced on the dirt. It was like trying to catch a fly with a spoon.
Throw it, yelled Jean. I finally did, and Bertie flipped in midair, scooted back toward third. As Jean heaved the ball and it sailed over my head, bounced off the glove of a lunging Izzy, and disappeared in the tall grass as Bertie just put his hands in the pockets of his shorts and strolled across home. Damn it, Bertie, how'd you do that? Bertie just grinned as I made my way toward the jungle to help look for the ball. Feeling bested? That night I caught Mom and Dad snuggled on the downstairs couch watching West Side Story on TV. It was one of their favorite movies and the only musical I ever liked because it had teenagers and a fair amount of danger and had better songs than Guys and Dolls. Seeing my parents on the couch also made me miss Helen. I used the kitchen phone and dialed 411. What city, please? Uh, South Hadley, is there a listing for a fish blat? A what now? Fish blat, F-I-S-H-B-L-A-T-T, like it sounds, on Grove Avenue. First name? Phyllis, but it might be Helen. I'm not, no fish blat in South Hadley. Is it a new listing? Uh, might be, yeah. I do have the Fleischmanns in Sunderland. No, that's someone else, thanks. I hung up, then started looking for a pen. Dear Helen, I had no luck finding your phone number with 411, so give me a call again when you can. I'm more nervous than ever about our big game coming up, which now looks like will be on Saturday, August 29th, a week before school starts. I was able to get a couple of Puerto Rican guys to play on our team, if they don't have to work. But who knows how many ringers Jerky Danny is drumming up. Also, my hopes of teaching our guys some extra skills with a speed clinic laid a big fart. Anyway, I miss you, and I'm still thinking a lot about our crazy afternoon swimming up there. Big squeeze, Joey. You've been listening to The Porch Roof Classic by Jeff Pullman. This retro baseball podcast novel was made possible by Spotify for Podcasters and Buzzsprout. Be sure to basket catch another episode next week. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to contribute, go to buymeacoffee.com slash jpolman54v. Thanks.